good morning everybody and uh, thanks to dr mayur for giving me an opportunity to speak in the hormone india program about endocrine approach to pathological fractures most of the times these are unaddressed or these are like uh, neglected in the clinical practice as because you just treat the fracture and don't look at beyond what is the reason behind it and why it is happening so in the next 15 to 20 minutes i shall be telling about some of the issues which we should be looking at in these patients so that the fracture morbidity and mortality is prevented i shall cover the topic under the following headings uh, introduction uh, what are the basic etiologies behind the pathological fractures relevant endocrine workup couple of slides about the hypophosphatemia how to approach and interspersed with some of our reports and some of our uh, studies also i'll touch upon so if you exactly look at what is the definition of a pathological fracture it's a fracture in bone tissue that is actually weak or remodeled basically it's not a properly formed fracture so that is most important to understand it has obviously altered mechanical and viscoelastic properties which makes it more prone for fractures and the bone disease may be a local or a diffuse you have a cyst in the bone you have some other tumor in the bone that's a local problem or you have a diffuse metabolic bone disease which can actually increase the susceptibility across all bones and some of them get fractured so the this is the spectrum of pathological fractures and obviously you have different terms for this that is a traumatic fracture fracture with normal or preserved bmd all those things but as we know the bmd in the conventional terms what we actually assess is the aerial bmd and the anybody who is outside the 2.5 standard deviations is considered as the abnormal one so what exactly is normal bmd or normal bone strength a lot of <clears throat> lot of issues behind that so that is we will keep it aside but identification of underlying etiology is the key in the management of looking at this problem when you look at the etiology of the pathological fractures the commonest malignancy be it leukemias or solid tumors you have lot of inflammatory disorders which affect the bone the rheumatoid celiac all those things if somebody is immobile somebody has got uh, strokes or some other things then that also increases the risk of fractures of that particular part and use of drugs which can affect the bone and endocrinopathies live right in the center which may have all these some of these uh, direct or indirect actions before we look at how to work up just a slide about what exactly is the hormonal control of bone remodeling the uh, left side slide is a bit busy but what i would say is there are many number of hormones which affect the bone functioning be it resorption as well as the formation to make it simple the estrogen is the one which inhibits the resorption and igf1 which promotes the formation and cortisol and pth both leads to increased resorption and cortisol as well inhibits the formation so basically the three four key hormones which have a role to play in the formation of the bone as we all know the formation is preceded by resorption so you have all these actions which may any alteration in these hormonal parameters will affect the bone formation and resorption coming to endocrine disorders per se leading to bone loss if you are looking from the perspective of endocrine disorders obviously the common being osteomalacia be it the calcium or phosphorus deficient or a glucocorticoid excess condition be it endogenous or exogenous and hyperthyroidism obviously affects the bone also reasonably uncommon or possibly not looked at is the hypogonadism diabetes and hyperparathyroidism some of them are neglected or uh, undetected but they are also in a reasonable number of uh, patients rarely some of these uh, conditions like uh, growth hormone deficiency acromegaly hyperprolactinemia anorexia nervosa all these also can affect to bone loss so this is a spectrum of endocrine disorders which can affect the bone and lead to bone loss we will go uh, some of the common ones now 
that is the osteomalacia basically what it means is the newly formed mineral uh, osteoid is not mineralized adequately it can be pth mediated fgf23 mediated or renal mediated but the clinical features remain the same the aches and pains antalgic gait frequent fractures loser zones all those things remain the same irrespective of the underlying etiology and uh, commonest available feature or clue in the clinical diagnosis is actually elevated alkaline phosphatase whenever you are looking at normal i mean you get a number of tests nowadays but the alkaline phosphatase should give a clue if it is elevated is there something to do with the bone so that should be the key factor other things depending on the availability the x rays will show thin cortex and loser zones and the definitive diagnosis may be after tetracycline labeling depending on the osteoid thickness and the lag time which mineralization lag time the spectrum of osteomalacia of these three conditions if you look at one as i said pth dependent commonly vitamin d deficiency which can lead to either primary or secondary hyperparesis affects the calcium and phosphorus absorption and you this hyperparesis will lead to internalization of np2 receptors and then lead to phosphate loss so both deficiency of calcium as well as phosphate loss will lead to a osteomalacia the fgf23 is the basic phosphaturic molecule so it produces from osteoblast and osteoclast again after affecting the phosphate loss it also inhibits the one alpha hydroxylation and redu reduced formation of the active form of vitamin d and there are multiple reasons why fgf23 mediated occurs the commonest being tumor induced osteomalacia and you have inherited forms also we'll dwell upon this slightly when i move to hypophosphatemic area the renal dependent it is uh, fgf23 is are normal other things are normal these are mutations or due to a fanconi syndrome of the proximal tubular dysfunction fgf23 fgf23 is are low and they can be both acquired or inherited so this is the spectrum of osteomalacia which can happen in these different uh, patients as i have said this is the disease the pth mediated disorders decrease in the vitamin d by poor intake or decreased 1 alpha 25 hydroxylation fgf23 being tumor induced osteomalacia autonomously secreting fgf23 or x linked or autosomal dominant and recessive varieties and renal ones being renal proximal tubular dysfunction or hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria one of our patient who was labeled as a spinal muscular atrophy and then said that nothing can be done was actually a osteomalacic myopathy due to a simple primary hyperparesis so before you label somebody with an irreversible disease or possibly there is no remedy we should all look at and screen for the metabolic bone disease and then the, because most of them are 100% amenable to therapies and uh, the improvement is remarkable glucocorticoid excess leads to bone loss by multiple mechanisms on the bone on the intestine so it is uh, commonest cause of so possibly abuse and they are mostly visible in that say we don't uh, miss these patients because they have all florid features of the cushings so but this is to be considered whenever there is a uh, bone loss per se which is not commensurating to the clinical picture very early stages of cushings may be where you just have maybe osteopenia and then you look at other features simple obesity maybe there may be a lurking glucocorticoid excess inside the genetic disorders are predominantly in the children and childhood commonest being osteogenesis imperfecta i will not go into other details but nevertheless there are plenty of other syndromes which affect the uh, bone formation and causes recurrent fractures you have different types of osteogenesis imperfecta the commonest being type 1 and autosomal dominant inheritance and you have other clinical features like blue sclera or other things which can give you some clue in the clinical diagnosis this was one of our report which had unilateral blue sclera then when compared usually you get a bilateral ones the third group which commonly is looked at in the bone loss is the drug induced bone loss especially relevant to endocrine drugs as i said glucocorticoids or possibly the thyroid hormone abuse where a lot of people take it for uh, 
weight loss or some other benefits but that should not disc that should be discouraged and any excess either iatrogenic or uh, intentional uh, drug induced hyperthyroidism all these things can cause bone loss the thiazolidone dione as a group also leads to bone loss but the usage of it has come a bit less nowadays other drugs which also can lead to bone loss so you should look at all these uh, drugs whenever you are uh, evaluating a patient with recurrent fractures and this is the spectrum of what fracture risk can happen in different endocrine disorders uh, most of the times the vertebral fracture risk is more some of the data is not available for particular drugs and the important thing is the dexa may be normal or high but still your fracture risk is more so that is most important to understand so your dexa may be not affected especially in diabetes whereas uh, others there may be a reduction in the t score so it is important to know the dexa normality does not preclude or prevent the patient from having a fracture because of a underlying endocrine disorders one of our study which looked at the effects on the bone and body composition with two different modalities in antithyroid drugs but both uh, the bone density we didn't have the fracture data because of less duration of follow up so the bone density improved in both but uh, same uh, irrespective of whether the patients were treated with the radioiodine therapy or with the antithyroid drugs so coming to clinical approach whenever you have a recurrent fractures or some other disease which suggests that there is a endocrine disorder look at either you can go by the fracture based how many types how many numbers how many frequency and obviously other symptoms to suggest a metabolic bone disease the classic acronym of uh, stones moans groans and uh, for hyperpara and gland based because if you have other clinical features which are looking at which are staring at you maybe a cushings maybe hyperthyroidism maybe hypogonadism so some of these features also in a background of uh, fracture will give you a etiological clue or possibly the history of uh, other members of the family affected or children getting affected or the consumption of drugs all those things are important to look at so your approach may be the start point may be fracture based or maybe a gland based or maybe depending other history which will give you some clue about how to go about in investigating these patients why i have said this is the importance of identifying the endocrine condition this was our paper published about the spectrum of parathyroid disorders which looked at uh, the delay in the diagnosis so if somebody had a fracture there was almost about two years delay before actually the patients were diagnosed with the underlying endocrine disease so somebody who presented with spondyloarthropathy the almost five years it took before you actually labeled the patient has got hyperpara so it is important to know not that everybody should be investigated but if you have two three other supportive symptoms suggestive features we should the threshold should be high to investigate these patients for the endocrine disorders what is the initial laboratory approach the simple mineral metabolism work up the calcium phosphorus creatinine vitamin d and alkaline phosphatase bone turnover markers uh, you would be hearing from professor ganpati now the <clears throat> uh, not very relevant but useful in more of follow ups and basic screening of all uh, cbc thyroid workup sugar testosterone hypogonadism all those things are important and depending on the alterations depending on the clinical profile you may have to follow up testing obviously to confirm the diagnosis what you have actually uh, thought about in the initial uh, phase the specific for the endocrine if you are looking at obviously the for the thyroid disorders thyroid profile diabetes simple for the glucocorticoid excess you do 8am cortisol and if you are suspecting endogenous you can look at ondst or low dose dexa suppression for hypophosphatemia you look at using trp and tmp gfr i'll spend couple of minutes here the basically when you are looking at approach to any hypophosphatemia now what is the renal wasting number 
and is that renal wasting appropriate for the GFR for the given patient? So these are the two key factors which will determine whether there is a renal phosphate leak or not. So if you have to calculate the TRP, you require a sample of urine and plasma, phosphorus and creatinine in the morning and the formula is given and if it is anything which is beyond 85 to 95 percent the reabsorption that means it is okay but if you have the more loss in the urine and which is when you plot it in the uh, algorithm for calculating the tmp gfr then you would get actually whether the phosphate wasting or not is happening at the face value, the TRP may not give you the value. So always I would suggest you should get the TMPGFR also along with it. And once you have the TMPGFR and confirm that there is renal phosphate wasting, then possibly there will be a role of FGF23. If it is low, it will suggest a proximal renal tubule dysfunction and hereditary forms will have most of the normal or elevated values. So to look at hypophosphatemic uh disorders hypophosphatemic osteomalacia commonly if you look at most of them have secondary if they have secondary hyperpara that is calcipenic rickets speed uh, vitamin d deficiency or nutritional calcium deficiency phosphopenic rickets and if you don't have a renal phosphate leak by trp then it is just a decreased intake of phosphate and if you have phosphate leak and if you look at vitamin d if vitamin that is a 125 vitamin D, if it is not appropriate, that means it is suppressed. That means because FGF23 is high, which is suppressing it. So it is FGF23 dependent, which is high in all these conditions. If it is normal uh, 125, then it is not FGF23 independent. It can be a fanconis or a proximal tubular dysfunction or isolated phosphate leak due to the mutations in the NP2, that is hereditary hyperphosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria or idiopathic hypercalciuria. If you have hypercalciuria, nephrolithiasis, then it is clinically, mostly it is primary hyperpara or very rarely if you have hypercalciuria without other things, you may look at other urocosuria or cystinuria or other conditions. So this is a spectrum of hypophosphatemic disorders which you should be looking at whenever there is a patient who has got multiple fractures. Another important thing is RTA, which generally comes in the pediatric to adult age group. Uh, spectrum of uh, distal RTA versus uh, proximal RTA, fasting urine pH is the one which determines. And you should look at bicarb and stone disease is usually seen in the distal one. Our study of about 90 patients who had the clinical profile of uh, distal RTA who were having suspected metabolic bone disease, recurrent unexplained hypokalemia, renal stones, all those things. So it is important whenever such patients come up, you should be investigating them for RTA also. Genetic approach mostly relevant in osteogenesis imperfecta patients. Other mutations are quite rare and not relevant in the clinical practice. DEXA is definitely useful just for documenting what is the z-score at that point of time and possibly helps in follow-up depending on whatever interventions we do and because these are like a uh, younger age group you don't actually have the classical guidelines about how to go about so most of the times the indications being more than two fragility factors or fractures at unusual site which you don't expect in a patient so these are the times where you should be doing DEXA and which will help in actually documenting the bone density at that point of time. The other modalities of uh, bone fragility evaluation are there, but most of them are in the research settings and not useful in the clinical settings. The TBS, HSA and QVS, maybe QCT also is going to be useful in the future. But as of now, mostly the reliance is based on the DEXA. So to conclude, Pathological fractures is a problem of etiology, and many hormones control the process of bone remodeling as I have said and high index of suspicion is required for unsuspected endocrine etiology. The focus will always remain on the fractures but we should look at what led to this uh, 
look for three p's in the vaca the phosphate potassium and parathyroid which will give the clue about hypophosphatemia rtas and hyperpara and you should always look at three o's in the diagnosis osteomalacia imperfecta and osteoporosis and most of the most important thing is the if you are able to identify an endocrine etiology it is always satisfying and rewarding because the patient can get cured and have permanent uh, treatment for the same and do not have to have the suffer with the fractures again you require a multidisciplinary team for this in the diagnosis and management because close support with the lab close support with orthopedician who is going to refer to you all those things are important in managing these patients finished here thank you for the opportunity given to me